Well, good morning, church family, and those in our community, or wherever you may be joining us today. We are thrilled to have you join us for our time of worship this morning. We hope you had a great Fourth of July yesterday, and been able to were able, was able to celebrate that in some manner or the other, whether it's in a quiet way with you and just your family, or extended family, or perhaps some got together with friends, hopefully in a social distance way during this time, of course, but. However it may have been for you, we hope you were able to enjoy and celebrate the 4th and remember and be thankful for this great country we do live in, in this country where we indeed have the freedoms that we are able to enjoy to come together and, and worship God as we're able to do this morning. It is a country, of course, without faults. We know that. We understand that. We've seen plenty of examples of that recently. But it is still a great country, and for that we can be thankful. When I was growing up, I had an uncle, really a great uncle of mine, that was really a great influence on me spiritually in many different ways, someone that I looked up to. And when I was growing up in particular, I remember one time when he was preaching a sermon at our church, and I forgot how old I was. I was, I think, in my young teens, perhaps, and I remember he got up and told the church, turn to the book of Hezekiah. And then he waited for a few moments, and you could hear the pages of the Bible turn. Of course, this is before cell phones where folks were flipping it up. You can hear the pages turn. And I have to confess to you, I was one of those turning the pages looking for the book of Hezekiah. And then finally he started laughing, and I looked and realized, wait, there is no book of Hezekiah. I have to confess to you, I don't remember the rest of the lesson. I just remember that moment and him making that point because Hezekiah is a person that is fairly well known in Scripture, a king, of course, and has uh, several stories and references really throughout the Old Testament. And he is a name which almost sounds like it should be a book, really, in some ways, if you think about it. You'd think there, there would be a book named Hezekiah, but as I realize and learn, and of course you know and realize, There is no book named Hezekiah. But there are many lessons we can learn from Hezekiah. And as I grew older and started reading and studying more about Hezekiah, I realized he's really very, in some ways, very complex individual. And so this morning, as we continue our walk through the Word, and as we continue to encourage and challenge one another to read through God's Word together this year, and in our church family, we're encouraging use of going through it with the one-year Bible, In our readings this past week, we did come across at least the version of Hezekiah's story that's found in 2 Kings. And there's no way that we can really, even through 2 Kings' version of the story, dive into it in great detail in our time together, though we'll look at several points from it. There are, I think, some principles we can learn from the story of King Hezekiah and the account of 2 Kings. And particularly at this time and this weekend, as perhaps we do think about our country and recognize where we are as a country and what we can do as a country. And it's not to compare Israel with America. I think sometimes we're guilty of that. And in no way am I trying to do that. But I do think there's principles here that we can all learn from. Principles that speak throughout all generations, no matter what country or in, or even as individuals where we may live. Things we can learn of what we can do and what we need to make sure that we do no matter where we are. But for this morning, particularly for those of us living here in America and I on this country and where we are, there's very important principles I think that we can learn from. And one of the lessons I think we can learn from the story of Hezekiah, particularly as we read about in 2 Kings, is we must make sure that we don't let society or our environment deter our commitment to God. Historically speaking, this time that Hezekiah became king in, it was not a very godly time at all. In fact, as we will read in just a moment, Hezekiah's father was Ahaz. Ahaz was one that did not follow God. And so Hezekiah had not really seen even in his own household from his father an example really of godliness. 
But even the society as a whole was one that was really not much of a godly society. In the end of chapter 2 Kings, chapter 17, it tried to describe in many ways just how ungodly the people of Israel had become. At this time, if you remember, there were actually two kingdoms. The kingdom had been divided. There was a southern kingdom and there was a northern kingdom, Israel and Judah, as they were called. And Israel in particular had become uh, people that were really very ungodly in what they did. And some of this, 2 Kings 17, particularly is describing them. But it's really talking about both kingdoms. And in verse 13 of 2 Kings 17, it says, The Lord warned Israel and Judah through all his prophets and seers, Turn from your evil ways. Observe my commands and decrees in accordance with the entire law that I commanded your ancestors to obey, and that I delivered to you through my servants the prophets. But they would not listen and were as stiff-necked as their ancestors, who did not trust in the Lord their God, They rejected his decrees and the covenant he had made with their ancestors and the statutes he had warned them to keep. They followed worthless idols and themselves became worthless. They imitated the nations around them, although although the Lord had ordered them, do not do as they do. They forsook all the commands of the Lord their God and made for themselves two idols, cast in the shape of calves. And in a share pole, they bowed down to all the starry hosts, and they worship Baal. These verses here in 2 Kings 17 give us just a, a snapshot of what was going on at the time. And in the end of chapter 17, it even acknowledges the fact that it continued on for generations to come. Society at this time in the, in the nation of Israel, in the nation of Judah, would not be considered a godly society at all. I know as we think about our country today, many feel that way as they look around. And though I think sometimes we overlook just the fact that there are still the majority of Americans that claim a belief in God, and there are things like Christian radio stations that are on our, our airways, and even the ability and freedom to be able to record videos like this and post them online. There's so many things we can still be thankful for, but I think sometimes those things get overlooked because we feel like, as a country, we're becoming less and less godly, and there's a lot of truth in that as well. But we must be careful that we don't allow what's going on in our society, we don't allow what's going on in our environment to deter that commitment. And we see that in Hezekiah. At the beginning of 2 Kings 18, it says, In the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother's name was Abaha, daughter of Zechariah. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, just as his father David had done. Now, I need to be clear, Hezekiah's father was not David. This was a reference back, though, to King David. And it almost shows the lineage of kings that really there was not much good that happened. So many of the kings had done evil before that. And he mentions back that Hezekiah's father was Ahaz. We learn from chapter 16, it says, Unlike David, his father Ahaz did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord, his God. So his father did not do right. His father did evil as a reference to that before. But we see Hezekiah become committed to doing the right thing. Verse 6, 2 Kings 18, He held fast to the Lord and did not stop following him. He kept the commands the Lord had given Moses. You know, I've heard... You hear so many people talk about the fact that they are the way they are because of their environment. And yes, I understand that one's environment does have a lot to do with how they are shaped. We cannot deny that. That is so true. And there's a lot of truth in that statement. But Hezekiah is an example that one's environment, where one is in society, if you will, 
is not an excuse for decision of not following God. Because in spite of what Hezekiah saw at home, in spite of what Hezekiah saw perhaps even among his friends and those around him, he still was committed to following God in a way really that had not been seen in quite some time, as we'll read more about in a second. You know, for us as a church today even, for us as God's people today, the reality is that society has an influence on it. And I, I don't mean that all in a negative way, but if you think about the homes that we have, if you think about what we have in our homes, you think about the clothes that we wear, the kind of cars that we like to drive, those things happen because of where we are as a society. We don't drive cars that were popular in the 1940s and 50s, mind you. Now, some do because they like that sound understandable, but we don't see that around a lot because that's not the style of today. And so the reality is that society does shape things. It shapes things we like. And that thing, in one sense, that's understandable. In one sense, that's okay. But what we must make sure about and we must be careful with is that we never allow the things we see in society to influence what our commitment to God should be. And Hezekiah shows us an example of how and lets us know that can, that can I'm sorry, that can be done. And one of the ways we do that, and the second lesson I think we can learn from King Hezekiah, is that we must recognize and remove the idols from our lives. Back in 2 Kings 18 and verse 4, he removed the high places, smashed the sacred stones, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke into pieces the bronze snake Moses had made, and for up to that time the Israelites had been burning incense to it. It was called Nehashtan. You see, we must make sure we recognize and be willing to remove the idols in our life. Hezekiah did that. There are some idols that were obviously idols that Hezekiah removed. But this reference to the bronze snake that Moses had made, most of you probably remember the story back from Numbers 21, when the Israelites did wrong in God's eyes and evil in God's eyes, and God, for sake of punishment, is in the wilderness and he's trying to teach them, actually sent snakes full of venom on into the nation of Israel and the people of Israel and started biting and killing people. And the Israelites went to Moses and basically, in a humble way, recognized they had done wrong. And Moses went and prayed to God. And God said, make a bronze snake and hold it up. And whoever, and lift the bronze snake up, and whoever lifts their eyes toward the bronze snake, they'll be healed of the snake's bites they have. And Moses did that. So when this was first made, it was actually a good thing. It was actually a symbol of healing. It is a symbol of cleansing. Jesus himself even references this in John chapter 3, uh, chapter 3, talking about just as Moses lifted up the bronze snake, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. That's right before, by the way, the very familiar passage of John three sixteen. So this was something that was actually commanded by God, ordered by God, but it become something very ungodly and it become an idol. And Hezekiah recognized that, and he had that bronze snake removed. I think it's a lesson for us that not all idols, or that idols are not always bad things. There are some things that can be good that can become idols. We've talked about it before, but we need to be reminded, work can become an idol. School can become an idol. Recreation can become an idol. Let's be honest, and I'm going to step on toes here, including my own college football, which we all hope happens this fall. But college football can become an idol. You see, there are things that in and of themselves are not bad. They're not evil. But if we're not careful and we allow it to, they can become idols 
in our life. And we must know this too, that others are watching. Others are noticing things that are important to us. And if we want to shine a light for people in our community, if we want to shine a light for people in our country, I believe it's imperative and important that people see us make sure that we don't allow anything to come before the Lord our God and that we worship Him and we worship Him only and recognize Him as being the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and the Father of His Son, Jesus. People must see us do that. They must see us make sure that we put nothing before God and are commitment, committed to Him no matter what we see going on around us. So we must recognize and be willing to remove the idols from our life. A third lesson we can learn from Hezekiah is that we must trust God and not riches. In verse 5 of 2 Kings chapter 18, we see that Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There is no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. That is a strong statement to be made about Hezekiah. Of course, to be honest, when you look through the rest of the kings of Judah, there were not a lot of very good, godly kings of Judah. But it is at least a good statement to be made about Hezekiah, that there was no one like him in his personal trust toward God. But Hezekiah was not perfect. If you read along and encourage you at some point, if you have your Bibles open this morning, as you're following along, you can glance at it. But if not, I hope at some point later you go back and read through the story of 2 Kings. But we see in 2 Kings 18 that what happens is that the king of Assyria, and actually two different kings of Assyria, but one king of Assyria we see go and, and march against Samaria and lay siege to it and actually capture the kingdom of Israel. Of course, Hezekiah remembers king of Judah. And a few years later, there's another king of Assyria that begins to reign. And it says, beginning in verse 13, in the 14th year of King Hezekiah's reign, second Canarab, king of Assyria, attacked all the fortified cities of Judah and captured them. So Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent this message to the king of Assyria at Lachish. I have done wrong. Withdraw from me, and I will pay whatever you demand of me. The king of Assyria is acted from Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. So Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasures of the royal palace. At this time, Hezekiah, king of Judah, stripped off the gold with, with which he had covered the doors and doorposts of the temple of the Lord and gave it to the king of Assyria. So we see Assyria, which became a very powerful kingdom at this time. They've already taken over Israel and the kingdom of Israel. Hezekiah, and I'm sure the people of Judah hear it. And so they come again now, they're attacking Judah. And Hezekiah, who Scripture says trusted God very strongly, in a way no other king had done so, no other king of Judah anyway. When this occurs, we don't see him turn to God right away. We actually see him do something to try to appease the king of Assyria. Some have tried to come up with reasons why Hezekiah may have done that. And I don't want to sound overly critical about Hezekiah. If I've been in shoes, I may have done the same. Perhaps he had thought that God, knowing how his father and others before him had um, turned their back to God, perhaps Hezekiah thought God had turned his back on them as a people and saw what was coming and was just trying to appease the king of Assyria for a little while. Perhaps that was going on. We really don't know for sure what happened here at Hezekiah. But we see Hezekiah at least put some more trust in riches, thinking that can appease the king of Assyria instead of turning right away to God. I think there's a great lesson we can learn here for us as people of God today. Because I can sit here and teach and 
You've heard plenty of lessons. We've had plenty of classes about trusting God, and we all shake our head, yes. We know we should trust God. We're supposed to trust God. We need to trust God, and in many ways, perhaps we do trust God. But sometimes, perhaps, even though we acknowledge that, even though we understand that, sometimes, perhaps, we get in circumstances, we get in situations that maybe we don't see any way out. And so maybe we turn to riches. Maybe we turn to something from an earthly perspective that we think will work instead of putting our trust in God. And that's something that, is, of course, we can all learn from. And we must make sure that in everything we do, every decision we make, that we strive to trust God. Another lesson we can learn from the story of Hezekiah is we must not allow the enemy to cause us to give up. You see, as we see the story continue in 2 Kings 18, what Hezekiah did in giving the riches to the king of Assyria didn't work. In fact, the king of Assyria went in and surrounded the city of Jerusalem and all the fortified cities, it says. And he went in and surrounded Jerusalem and basically cut off resources of people of Jerusalem, cut off resources that allowed them to get food, allowed them to be able to sustain life. It was a dreary time for the people in Jerusalem. And so the king of Assyria actually sends his supreme commander, his chief officer, his field commander, to Hezekiah and to deliver a message. And in this message, we see something happen that is a very important principle we need to always remember, and that's this, that the enemy, in particular if you think about Satan as an enemy, but the enemy can be deceitful. Verse 19, the field commander said to them, Tell Hezekiah, this is what the great king, the king of Assyria, says. On what are you basing this confidence of yours? You say you have the counsel and the might for war, but you speak only empty words. On whom are you depending that you rebel against me? Look, I know you're depending on Egypt, that splintered reed of a staff, which pierces the hand of anyone who leans on it. Such is Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to all who depend on him. But if you say to me, we are depending on the Lord our God, isn't he the one whose high places and altars Hezekiah removed? Saying to Judah and Jerusalem, you must worship before this altar in Jerusalem. Come now, make a bargain with my master, the king of Assyria. I will give you 2,000 horses if you can put riders on them. How can you repulse one officer of the least of my master's officials, even though you're depending on Egypt for chariots and horsemen? Furthermore, have I come to attack and destroy this place without word from the Lord? The Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Very interesting words being spoken here, very complex words. We can dig deep into it in many ways. In another time, in another setting, we will do that perhaps. But as the field commander spoke, there's some things that he said that are almost deceitful because there was an element of truth to them. Because Hezekiah apparently had kind of depended on Egypt and asked Egypt for help at this time. But Egypt was not powerful enough to withstand the Assyrian army. And the field commander even recognized that Hezekiah had removed the high places and altars. That was correct. But he was deceitful in almost presenting that perhaps God was angry about that. Because Hezekiah removed, had removed multiple places in which to worship God. Even though really God had not ordained those places, God wanted true worship, of course, in the temple at this time. And so he really presents things in a very deceitful way. And he even concludes by saying, the Lord himself told me to march against this country and destroy it. Well, that was deceitful because God had really made a decision ultimately to destroy his people, at least in some ways we see carried out, but that had not come to the Assyrian commander. Throughout this thing, we, we see the field commander, really from the king of Assyria, but deceitful with what he presented to Hezekiah and to all the people. 
And we all must remember, as children of God, our enemy, the Satan, he is deceitful. He has always been deceitful from the time in the garden with Adam and Eve. He remains deceitful today. Jesus says that truth is a foreign language to Satan. And he, when he lies, to be honest with you, he's good at it. All of us know people, perhaps, that lie so much, they become good at lying, that it becomes believable. And that's what Satan does. And we must remember the enemy can be deceitful. And we also need to understand that the enemy strives to discourage. Again, back in the story, verse 26, and Elikiah, son of Hekiah, and Shebna and Joal said to the field commander, Please speak to your servants in Aramaic, since we understand it. Don't speak to us in Hebrew in the hearing of the people on the wall. But the commander replied, Was it only to your master and you that my master sent me to say these things, and not to the people sitting on the wall, who, like you, will have to eat their own excrement and drink their own urine? And then the commander stood and called out in Hebrew, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. This is what the king says. Do not let Hezekiah deceive you. He cannot deliver you from my hand. Do not let Hezekiah persuade you to trust in the Lord when he says, The Lord will surely deliver us. The city will not be given into the hand of the king of Assyria. Then skipping down the end of verse 32, he goes on to say, do not listen to Hezekiah, for he is misleading you when he says, The Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the king, hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Zephyrbiam, Hena, and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then, can, how then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? The request is made by the servants of Hezekiah. Please don't continue to speak in Hebrew, speak in Aramaic, because they don't want the common people to hear the threats really that is being made. And the field commander says, listen, I'm not just wanting Hezekiah and y'all to hear it, I'm wanting all the people to hear what I have to say. And I think that's because what he's trying to do is discourage the people of Israel, even the common people, and making it appear as if there is no hope. One of the things I hear quite regularly, even people of God say today and people in our churches say, what's going on with our country? There is no hope. They see what's happening. They see how people are turning away. They wonder if there's any hope left. And to be honest with you, I can understand the concern is valid. I can understand the discussion. But sometimes I wonder if that's not Satan at work trying to discourage all of us. Because that's what Satan wants us to see. That is what Satan wants us to hear. All of us, he wants to be able to see and hear. Perhaps maybe there's not hope. What good is it to do anything different? And we see the enemy of Judah here try to cause the enemy to be deceitful, uh, the enemy to give up. That's really what they want. They want the people of Israel just to give up here, as many commentators agree on. And they do it by trying to present things in a deceitful way and cause discouragement among the people. And we must not allow the enemy to use those things to cause us to give up, to give up hope, to give up from, up from thinking that we can be a positive influence on others. And one last lesson we can learn is that we must seek God. Looking at 2 Kings 19, when King Hezekiah heard this, heard the message that came from the king of Assyria, from the field commander's, presented to him by his servants. When he heard this, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and went into the temple of the Lord. He sent Eliakim, the palace administrator, Shevna, the secretary, 
and the leading priests, all wearing sackcloth, to the prophet Isaiah, son of Amos. They told him, This is what King Hezekiah says. This is a day of distress and rebuke and disgrace. As when children come to the moment of birth, and there is no strength to deliver them. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of the field commander, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to ridicule the living God, and that he will, will rebuke him for the words the Lord your God has heard. Therefore pray for the remnant that still survives. Perhaps Hezekiah has learned his lesson, instead of trusting in riches and things of this earth, he knows he's supposed to turn to God and seek God. And he does that here. He goes and seeks God, and at least goes and seeks godly counsel through the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah sends a message that basically says that God has listened, that God is not going to allow the king of Assyria and the messenger to ridicule God, and he's going to cause really harm and destruction to them. In the meantime, a second letter comes to King Hezekiah from the king of Assyria. And we see after Hezekiah received the set, that letter, him also responds seeking God. Verse 19, 14, I'm sorry. Hezekiah received the letter from the messengers and read it. Then he went up to the temple of the Lord and spread it out before the Lord. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, Lord, the God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. Give ear, Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, Lord, and see. Listen to the words that the cherubs have sent to ridicule the living God. It is true, Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them. For they are not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by human hands. Now, Lord our God, deliver us from his hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you alone, Lord, are God. We must learn. We must be willing to make sure that we seek God, that we remember who he is, recognize who he is, and make sure we turn to him, and make sure we turn to him in prayer. We mentioned last week at the end of our lesson not to forget about the power of prayer. Prayer is very powerful. And God is still at work. God is still alive. And I believe He can still make a difference in people's lives on this earth and in this country and in this world, don't you? But for Him to do so, we must remember that for some people, the first Bible they read and it's from the only Bible they read is the lives they see us as his people live out. So let's make sure we seek God. Let's turn to him in prayer. Let's present our requests to him. Let's let him know our concerns. Listen to his answers. Study his word. Be revived by his word. Remember all that he has done. And let's go and strive to tell Satan, Satan, no, we're not going to give up. You can't discourage us to the point that we're going to give up. We're going to make sure we get rid of idols in our lives and hope others can get rid of idols in their lives and truly see that our God alone is God. So many lessons we can learn from Hezekiah. So much more can be said, and I know I've said enough this morning. This story we can all learn from. And as I said earlier, particularly as this weekend we focus on our country, we recognize the faults of our country, we all have concerns. But let's always remember, though, that as Jesus prayed for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, is something that's a prayer of ours as well. And that our lives be used by God to make a difference to those around us. This morning, maybe people recognize they've got idols in their life, and maybe some that recognize you've always worshipped idols and you really have not committed your life to worshiping the one true God, and you desire to get rid of all idols in your life and, and commit your life to God and to Jesus once and for all. If you desire to do that this morning, 
please contact us. Let us know. We'd love to study with you. We'd love to help you. Maybe that you're ready to say you do believe that Jesus is who he claims to be and ready to commit your life to him and change your life to following him and be buried with Christ in baptism, raise a change, forgiven person. If you desire to do that, we, of course, would love to help you with that and make that happen. For many of us that have done that already, let's spend some time evaluating our own lives. Make sure we, our commitment to God is strong. Make sure that we don't have idols we're chasing, but to recognize that God can and desires to use us to make a difference in people's lives around us. Let's close in prayer. God, there's so many great stories in Scripture we can learn from, so many great stories in Scripture we, we can be inspired with and encouraged with. And I'm thankful for the story of Hezekiah, one who committed his life to you in spite of what he saw at home, in spite of what he saw in his society. And help us all to learn that and to strive to commit our lives to you in that way. And we are thankful for this country. We've seen its faults. We've seen it recently. We know that it is this. So, Father, help us as your people, as your children, to make sure that we are committed to shining your light and the light of your Son for others to see. And help us commit our lives to that. Father, we, we pray for guidance as, our, as a country. We pray for wisdom for our leaders and our community and our state and our nation, our world to help us. And we pray that they make decisions in a way that as Scripture says that we can live quiet, godly, holy lives and in such a way that we can share the good news of Jesus. We pray for that to be able to continue. We pray you give them wisdom as they make decisions about what's best for us so we continue to deal with this pandemic. We pray for our nurses, folks in the medical field, our first responders, people in the front lines, continue to watch over them. And Father, as we continue to go through life, as we go through these days, we're thankful for moments like today that we have, that we come in and worship, that we can be reminded that you're on the throne, no matter what we see going on around us. And we can be reminded that we always have hope because of your son, Jesus. We look forward to celebrating his sacrifice and remembering that together here this morning. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.